Good morning. I'm Jeff Cavanaugh, leader of the Infosys Knowledge Institute. I'm excited to be with you here in Dallas this morning and share findings from our recent digital radar research and discuss how companies can thrive in the digital economy. First, in many of our client conversations, they've shared a common concern. How can you transform the business to create value for the long term when you're facing the daily pressures of a short-term world. That's one of the, the big things. So we've been doing some research uh, in a variety of ways, as Vivek mentioned, talking to thousands of, of, of clients, uh, of, of executives out in the market, some cases, some in-depth discussions, and we'll share some of those. We're gonna focus on today is this most recent report, our digital radar report that was released at the World Economic Forum a few weeks ago, and it's available to be downloaded, and we'll, we'll go through some highlights here. We'll talk about a digital maturity index, a way to, to look at uh, where companies are, especially at the initiative level, to get a sense, uh, barriers companies are finding in industry comparison, as well as different accelerators, um, how, how, how companies are being successful, and also uh, what the visionaries are doing. Back in uh, March of last year, we undertook the first study, talked to 1,000 uh, executives, and tried to get a sense, really, where are people? You know, where are they in this digital journey? And it was interesting. It sorted out very cleanly into three big areas. Uh, and we named them based upon the characteristics of these areas. Uh, we had one that's called Watchers. Certainly working hard, a lot of initiatives going on. Very efficiency focused, though. Lots of proofs of concept. Really hadn't gotten to scale. Another group, we called them Explorers because they were going further and farther, and they were doing a little more with customer experience. They were thinking that was what digital was, customer experience. They really weren't going at the core business model, though. And, and there's still a bit of a risk aversion. And then there was a group, a smaller group, we call them visionaries, that in some cases broke what was working because they felt there was a risk. Or they set up a parallel business that might cannibalize. Uh, or in some cases made strategic decisions to start to exit certain businesses. They were bolder knowing there was risk involved. And it wasn't, wasn't a, a safe bet necessarily, but it was one they felt they needed to take. We'll have some quotes come up along the way. You know, uh, Steve Lynch was fantastic in one of our, dis you know, several of our discussions uh, about, you know, in his, his mind, as, as risky as all these things are, he was very energetic. And, and uh, Citizens Bank, familiar with Citizens Bank, uh, major financial services organization. They're very excited about this because they think that they can help them compete more effectively. But again, we'll look at this, these dualities of risk and opportunities we go along. We then did another round of research late last year, so probably eight months later. It was interesting how the shift had occurred that while these companies in the visionary category were more or less the same, a lot of companies had made progress and moved from this watcher category to explorers. So there's a good amount of movement. And what's interesting as well, uh, one of our clients, Estee Lauder, uh, Rohit Setia, one of the, uh, the leaders there, over the whole product launch area, that transition between supply chain and procurement into, into the market, said, you know, we're an explorer. We've got to be a visionary. And you might say, well, maybe explorer is good enough. But in their case, they're seeing that if they don't take some steps, they don't get there, that it's an existential issue for them. So we saw that more and more, that one, it wasn't the nice to have, and two, people weren't, um, I don't say embarrassed or defensive. They said, you know, here's where we are. We have these issues today. We have our constraints, and then here's what we'd like to do. To give a little more quantitative about this, we said, you know, how do you really look at maturity? You can simply have these one to fives or, or, or very qualitative, but we tried to get a little more quantitative about it. And so we looked at 22 different digital initiatives and said, where are people on these? And again, you could simply have a popularity test or something very high level, superficial. We thought something that was indicative of how far you are is, are you planning or maybe you aren't started yet? Have you executed proofs of concepts? Have you completed some pilots so you're actually in production, maybe in a small capacity, or have you done something at scale? Because doing something at scale in production is pretty much that's maturity because it's part of your operating model, part of your business. And we created an index, the index from zero to 100, so it was a way of normalizing, across these 22. And so the number of companies across 1,000 from zero up to 100, 
18% in the watchers category, 61 in the explorers, and 21 in the visionaries. Over time, that, that is moving, as you'd expect, to the left, but it's a handy thing for us to do now. And you might say, well, what are these uh, initiatives? And so we looked at these three clusters across these 22 initiatives. First of all, there's something we call foundation. Things like cybersecurity, business process management, legacy modernization, things that are kind of like the concrete beneath your feet, a little more complex, but they need to be done. Then what we call mainstay. When you think about digital, you often think about cloud, DevOps, agile. You think about artificial intelligence and RPA. This, we call the mainstay because this is where a lot of companies are, at least these beginning in the middle of them. And then we, we had a category called customer. It was customer and product because in some cases it's manufacturing. The fact is it's more customer facing, customer centric. There's an experience element to it. Uh, there's certainly uh, marketing. It's also a product orientation. And the last we're calling forefront. These are the things that maybe you still think are exploratory, but they're real and in some industries are making an impact. AR, VR, blockchain, and drones. So, okay, given that, and given that this is just starting, and that's, that's maturity, let's see where, where, th where, where, where clusters stacked up. The watcher category I mentioned before, across these 22, it appears that there is watching going on more so than, than maturity. There are some notable exceptions, like cybersecurity, for example. It's one where companies are farther along. Maybe it's because of compliance, maybe it's because there's just the sheer risk in your face of something you know, that can go wrong. Uh, and so the burning platform is a, is a motivator. Hopefully, motivation occurs before then uh, as well. But, and then also, as you might expect, cloud and big data analytics, there's some progress there, more maturity. And then the one area in the customer category, digital marketing, maybe it's connection to CRM, you get some campaigns, you're starting to get to know your customer a little bit better. That's the that's watcher group. The explorers, it follows a similar pattern. Cybersecurity, a little more mature, big data analytics, and you start to see automation, DevOps, you're making progress, and then also a, a bit of a spike in digital marketing. Still, not much in the other areas. All right, who are these so-called visionaries and what are they doing? There is a marked difference for the companies that have taken that, that step. Because remember, this means that, that these initiatives are at scale uh, as you get farther out. And so you see, for, for many of the foundation and mainstay, there's a fair, to, fair amount of maturity. Still, there's, there's a lot more to be done for artificial intelligence, automation, we expect, especially the more cognitive part. And a lot of progress, maybe 3D printing and additive manufacturing is still you know, sorting through the logistics, what's it mean for the supply chain going forward, and then some maturity uh, here. So it's an interesting way of looking at it, and I would challenge you or, or, or ask you maybe uh, at some point, now think about where you are in this. Do you have other initiatives? I'm sure. These 22, though, seem to have the um, fairly comprehensive. And I think in an SAP discussion, legacy modernization and moving to these other areas, how does SAP fit with that? Talk about the so-called intelligent enterprise. What does it mean to be intelligent? And where are you on that? So it's a way of organizing it and perhaps presenting even to the people that fund or gate your, uh, your initiative, your, your programs, you need to do certain things because you need those in place from S4 so that you can move more to that visionary category. Watchers you mentioned, mostly foundation. They're, really, they're building a foundation, which is great. It's just there's a, time, there's a value and a cost of delay of time. And I think the watcher category, they're not fully taking that into account. And I'll, a couple examples we'll show everything in a moment. Explorers. They're focusing more on the mainstay, which is getting a lot of progress with AI, RPA, and these other areas. Visionaries, I think there are a few things I wanted to call out, maybe for your consideration. One, this lean forward mindset. What appears to be, well, that's advanced. It's not really you know, production today. That's tomorrow's operating system. That's tomorrow's standard practice. And if, and if we all, in the abstract agree, there's a value, there's a time value of money, there's a time value of experimenting and learning, then the sooner these become part of the vernacular and you test what that means, how does it integrate with your platform, you work the protocols, what are the security risks when you have drones, et cetera, you start getting there faster. The other thing is acting decisively and looking at culture and business models. Those are two fancy terms, but it, you can't get to scale 
and move beyond the proofs of concepts and the pilots until you start getting into those sticky issues. All right, that sounds all great, but what, about, what are the barriers? We looked at 13 of them, top 10 are listed here, and I wanted to call out a few of them. One of them at the top was this inability to experiment quickly. That's a huge concern for people. Can we run enough experiments? Can we get enough feedback quickly enough to learn from it? And I think that's where people are right now. They're doing a lot of these experiments and pilots. It was interesting how optimistic people, though, though people were about next year and beyond. That shouldn't be an issue. I think it's because design and design thinking has become so prevalent, or at least the, the terminology. People are confident. Again, I think it's a bit of an overconfidence about moving this to scale, but the experimentation part, understand. The other area is legacy systems. It's a big concern, it remains a big concern. You would think over time that would have gone down. As you know from your day-to-day -day job, that's a still big concern. The other is change management. While it wasn't as huge a concern today, people think as they move from the experimentation to scale, it's where the change management comes in. Because you don't just have this lab off to the side somewhere. You, you have to deal with your, your broader employee population and your partner groups. And it was actually, I believe, higher than this, based upon the anecdotes from a lot of the people we spoke with. Industry-wise, there wasn't a huge separation. There were some outliers, like the technology companies, like Semicon Software. They're farther along, as you might imagine, because they have the hints of digital native in some cases. Uh, some of the more regulated areas, like healthcare, uh, were farther, farther back. It's a bit misleading, though, because automotive, for example, is doing some fantastic things, like with autonomous and the core product. At the same time, when you talk, in fact, that's what Adyen is, it's a large automotive seating manufacturer, the tier one or tier two aspects of automotive, it's brutal, because they don't have that brand and that connection with the consumer, and yet they're still having to fight these digital wars in a commodity environment. So the, the companies that don't have that, that connection to the customer uh, in these industries are really, really up against it because they don't have the money. And off, oftentimes, the boards right now, they're saying, let's take care of cash flow, let's do some financial reengineering. And these programs are being put on hold. And if they do an SS4 or an SAP program, they might do the bare bones. They might not really go far enough to get a lot of the business value. And that's what we're seeing for some of these industries. Given those, what do you do about that? From our, from our interviews, from our surveys, uh, five areas emerged that people being successful are adopting. Design, learning, automation and AI, agile and DevOps, and then workforce location strategies. And we'll go through each of these. I think what was interesting is, in a very similar way to the initiatives we saw before, these five, the companies that scored high in the digital maturity index also, there's clear separation here, so it was consistent. Maybe not causation, but certainly correlation. Let's go in briefly into each one. So Agile and DevOps, it's exciting. I think every, every one of you, I'm sure, if you're not Scrum certified, uh, you have all these programs and projects going on. What we are seeing, though, is that a lot of companies are still doing it in pockets, and it's not uh, across the board or at scale. And where it's trying to be at scale, it's still very centrally managed. And by not finding a way to federate and distribute it, they're getting caught in either extreme. You can't let all the, the teams run wild, and yet you also can't have this, this very tight central control. I think companies are struggling with that. Uh, I think also what we've seen, especially talking with uh, Alok, who runs the thousand or so people, literally all product owners and, and scrum masters in our company, that there are still places where the value chain is fragmented. And trying to put an agile when there are a lot of uh, the, these, these open loops is difficult. So there's still a place for lean that will help these happen. Automation and AI. Of course, the buzzword, the trend. I think they're, they're, rather than deal with the technology aspects of that right here, that there are a couple other aspects we see as, 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 as barriers. One, the understanding the ethical implications and the black box nature. Years ago, when I was working with the plant optimization, the black box uh, kept a lot of executives from implementing, because even if the answer was right, they didn't quite trust it, what went behind it. And that trust started to happen when people saw charts and graphs, and they saw rules, and, and really what was going on behind the scenes. So I think going from a black box to a white box is going to be very important uh, for AI. 
Also, John, uh, our, our, local, our global head of AI, this idea about ethics. Uh, we had a panel at the World Economic Forum. We had a Carnegie Mellon's AI in the Computing Science Department. And they've actually repurposed their freshman English course, the one humanities the geeks had to take, to something where they thought about the implications of technology decisions. Don't blindly trusting it, but actually getting in the different trade-offs. Uh, what can happen if you have a rule, what well, are implications? Like an autonomous, for example. If you have evasive action, what is the, what is the decision-making process on what's acceptable and what's not? It's interesting because design, people think about that with the user experience, and maybe the product design. Design is very pervasive, multiple disciplines, and the visionaries are doing, are thinking about systems design, systems thinking. And that's an area that rethinking uh, an area, so, so like for, for, for product or design, user experience, thinking about the customer service, the, the, the product launch, the manufacturing, you know, all these in more of an integrated approach, not these departmental silos. That was a big difference we saw with the visionaries. And design as a discipline is hard. If you look at the leaders, they actually have measurements with the same rigor about design quality as they do for financial performance. And we do see that being a big difference. People talk about design, but again, it's not just design thinking where you have a nice workshop, you have to follow through and, and drive it to your business. The fourth area is learning. Again, everyone gets this idea of lifelong learning, but how do you make it real? We see too many companies who have underfunded programs or they have this either or approach. Well, it's the employee's responsibility or it's almost unilateral where they push it and very prescriptive. We found companies like, like uh, Estee Lauder and also uh, United Airlines where it's very much a partnership. Employees realize they need the, the, the rescaling, they need this continuous. And so it's more of a partnership offering up the platforms, allowing the self-serve to happen because the, in, the instructor-led uh, programs uh, are not going to be the focus going forward. So I think, I think part, partnering aggressively and getting people the skills they need. The fifth area is proximity. You might think, well, that's just where you put your people. The visionaries we saw thought very, very uh, deliberately about where they cluster people, where they work with their partners. Vivek had mentioned the hubs, you know, these emphasis as, as a case study. We chose access, like, like in Raleigh, for our financial services center. A lot of back office, not just clients there, but just it's the hub for that. Access to universities and places people want to work. And you mentioned four, I know it's not official official, but we also have one on Richardson here that's well on the way. I think we crossed 1,000 people. We're formally inaugurating it later, but it's, it's very much up and running and serving a lot of local clients. So we're thinking through the, these ideas. It isn't just you have a campus or you have a low-cost location somewhere. There's also this nearby partnering approach and deciding which, which uh, skills to put. What does it take? To be a visionary, what's distinct? There are two things that we think uh, we've been seeing. One, this idea of amplifying, focusing on the largest problems where you can have the biggest impact. And it sounds simple, but this idea of prioritization and having more of a deliberate approach and staying with it. I think that speaks very well to, to a crowd that cares about SAP S4 HANA because how do you keep a program in place when you have quarterly results? You don't get the budgets you need. They'll say, I keep your program going, but by the way, half your people or that thing you wanted to do to get all the extra business benefits, we're going to pull back on that for now. And so you're trying to program manage in that constrained environment. Have a long-term perspective. And also, this is what really came out. Many of the people we spoke with, be comfortable with different units in the company being at different places. Some could be watchers, some could be explorers, some could be visionaries, because Different units have their different priorities, and that's okay. And I, and I think that was a nice counterbalance to some of the companies that were struggling when they were trying to get everybody pulling them along, allowing, company, allowing different units to proceed at different level, paces. The other thing is a partnership. Maybe this is a good venue to talk about this. Um, it wasn't a setup. Uh, visionaries tended to be much better at partnering. In fact, if you, if you look, they will go outside for much more work, and it isn't a pitch to go outside as much as their processes and their governance are stronger. They can go outside. They know how to measure. They're more mature about working together. And what that means is they can get skills very quickly on a temporary basis 
or even in some cases we're seeing uh, the possibility of acquiring the service provider if it's a boutique, if it's a niche, especially if you're a large organization. And that is something that was kind of unexpected, but we had several questions we wanted to explore with partnerships. And visionaries tend to be really good at devising partnerships and setting them up. Uh, Kurt over at United Airlines, he, he was adamant about this. He said, you know, it kind of goes back to old school where the relationship, much more than managing a contract, is, is setting up the relationship aspect right. Again, in a digital, disconnected, asynchronous world, sometimes this can be left by the wayside, but it's really helped them on a massive legacy modernization upgrade program. Those are the main, main points we wanted to highlight. There's a lot more behind it. We have uh, been doing thought leadership for some time. We decided at the board level last year to really focus and centralize uh, support for this. So you'll be seeing more research uh, coming from us. <laughs> Hopefully, you subscribe to newsletters and things like that. It'll be a resource that we hope that will complement the, the great technical resources you're getting and the tech, uh, great process and industry uh, information you're getting. We also want to make sure that we're able to complement that, and maybe it helps with your business case. It helps you know, look at where things are coming. All right? I think I'm out of time. Thanks for your time. <laughs>